All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the zoo. Uh, my name is Holly Gillette, and I am the membership engagement chair for MESC, Museum Educators of Southern California, which is uh, hosting this program today. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of this land, the Gabrielino Tongva people. I also want to thank the Los Angeles Zoo and Dan Keefe, especially, who just lowered the lights, <laughs> for not only generously hosting this program, but also collaborating on this program. Dan has played a huge part in developing the content uh, that we're going to go through today together. I'd also like to point out a couple of my mess colleagues. Hannah, can you, yay, Hannah, <laughs> and Michael, where's Michael? Michael back there. So Hannah and Michael and I ha and Dan have really worked hard to put together this event today, and uh, we've really enjoyed the process. Also, I want to point out some of the MESC board members who are here today. So if you're on the MESC board and you're in the room right now, could you stand up or raise your hand? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So also a quick note that we are recording the panel today, um, the first portion of this program, um, so that we can share the wealth uh, beyond those who are able to make it today. So it's a pretty intimate experience. Our capacity was pretty low for this program just because of the interactive activity that we'll be doing inside the zoo. So we wanted to make sure to uh, video record this first portion and then if you wanna take a look uh, in a couple short weeks, we'll have that up on our website. Thank you, Jonathan, in the back for uh, recording this today. So what is MESC? So we are an inclusive alliance of critically aware museum educators who cultivate and build strategic relationships rooted in sharing resources and encouraging experimentation that empowers the field. We value transparency, community, inclusivity, and solidarity. As such, today's program will focus on empathy and the museum. Our goal is to learn all about the different types of empathy and how museum professionals can infuse empathy into their work. So everyone in the room today uh, is joining us for a variety of reasons. So I encourage you to think about the reason why you showed up today and set an intention for this afternoon. So in your notes page, on page three of the packet that you picked up at registration, it has some notes. If you could just take a moment to write a word or two or a short phrase about your intention for today. All right, so keep that in mind as we go through the day today. So what's actually happening? So first up, we have a really fantastic panel of speakers um, that'll be more of a dialogue and conversation uh, about empathy and their work specifically. So we ask that uh, you hold your questions actually to uh, the last portion of the program. Um, because we're gonna have a lot of time for reflection at the end, and some of the panelists will stick around uh, for the last hour of the program. After the panel, we'll have a short break where we have coffee and treats, um, and it's gonna actually be down the hallway here in classroom uh, B, and that is where uh, this other portion of the program will be. So we'll have a short break for coffee and treats, and then we'll actually be going out into the zoo in the uh, Winnick Family Children's Zoo. Then after that experience, then we'll come back and reflect. And then at the end of uh, the day today, we actually are having a MESC community program. It's a program that we have monthly um, over Golden Road Brewery where we can continue the conversation. So it's a no host uh, happy hour. And so we hope you're able to join us uh, to continue the conversation after the program. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is that we are giving away three memberships to MESC 
uh, generously donated by an anonymous donor. And this is actually kicking us off for our Giving Tuesday campaign. So um, we have some flyers, so make sure you take one before you leave today uh, about Giving Tuesday. So Giving Tuesday, uh, we are hoping to raise money to help with programming such as this. One of the things that we uh, really stand for with MESC is to give honorariums for all of our speakers to make sure that we're paid for the work that we do. And so that's something that we stand by with all of our programs. So your support on Giving Tuesday would be very helpful to um, MESC as the organization. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. So first we have Dr. Veronica Alvarez, who is the Director of School and Teacher Programs at LACMA. You wanna go, hi, you wanna stand up? Come on up. If you wanna sit in your chair. Thank you. I know, it's a little intimate experience. It's kind of weird with the mic, right? Uh, Dan Keefe, who's the Director of Education here at the zoo, if you come join us. We also have Jordana Gessler, who's the Director of Education at the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. And then we have uh, Diana Terrazas, the Community Outreach Manager at the Autry Museum of the American West. And I'm actually gonna hand over the mic to Veronica first. I should have put that slide up. They're lovely faces. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and um, kind of do the definitions that we agreed upon to talk about empathy and the different types of empathy that each of our works relates to. And then um, we're gonna sit down for discussion and I'm, I'm gonna have a, a question for each of the panelists and then have kind of a broader di um, discussion with all of them. So again, we're gonna go through definitions and then each of us are gonna address um, how each we apply each of these empathies in our work and give examples from our work. Okay, so empathy. It's um, what we agreed upon and what we wanted to discuss is a simulated emotion, emotional state that um, relies on the ability to perceive, understand, and care about the experience or perspective of another person or animal. We are in a zoo after all. So what are the, so that's like the basic definition of empathy that we wanted to address. And then, but there's different types of empathy related to each of those that I mentioned about perceiving, understanding, and caring. So the first one is effective empathy. And this is the ability to sense or sometimes experience the perceived emotions of another person or animal. Um, so this is effective empathy. Is that empathy, you know, when you're watching, and that's why I put, chose those slides, when you're watching a scary movie and you hear the music coming on and your heart starts to like pump, and then, or you know, or the woman's trying to run away from the scary guy and you're like in it with her, right? Or him, um, and you're in it and you're so caught up in the movie, so you're starting to empathize. And that's because when that happens, when we see somebody in a very emotional state, our brain starts to mirror that. And from their mirror neurons that happen in our brain. And so um, this is a learned behavior and that's why you get that suspense and that heartful. And um, I was thinking, <laughs> Julia right now was talking about, and this happens from infancy. If you worked, like I did in a childcare center, if one baby starts to cry, several babies, they all start to cry they're experiencing those mirror neutrons and they're seeing that somebody hearing that somebody is in a different emotional state, so they respond. And Julia just gave me another example. I don't know if it happens with um, animals, but she said they were in the zoo and one goat started peeing and then all the goats started peeing. So I was like, <laughs> is that an example of animals exhibiting effective empathy? I don't know, Dan, do you have <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but I just, I had the baby um, example from the research that I was doing about that, and I'm like, oh, maybe the goats are doing the same thing in a different capacity. So that's affective empathy. Um, so that's the ability of like perceiving. Cognitive empathy is the one that we probably most relate to or kind of walking in somebody else's shoe. That's usually like our go-to definition when we think of empathy. But it's the ability to understand experiences of others by imagining yourself in their space, in their, in their reality. And this is why storytelling is so important in empathy when you hear somebody else's story. And, and then obviously I use this a mile in my shoes. If you've never heard of this museum, you literally walk a mile in someone's shoes and hear their story. So this is a museum that 
um, got stories of different people, and then you re you borrow their shoes, and then you take like kind of an audio tour, and you walk a mile in their shoes, and it's supposed to elicit empathy for that reason. Um, and this this is where um, like the idea of understanding and language is very important, like a common shared language, a common cultural language, and this is um, why I think um, this idea of understanding and really Listening is a really important part of empathy. Um, listening and hearing are two different things. Sometimes we hear people, but we don't listen. And that's part of, too, the brain. You know, when somebody's telling your story, you're already thinking of your own version of the story or how your experience was much more interesting than the story you're hearing, or that you're already, like, kind of thinking or contradicting or, you know, thinking of ways that you can possibly have a different example of the person so we don't tend we just tend to hear but not really listen so this idea of just taking the time to listen to another story and as this museum does like literally walking in someone else's shoes is very important so that's cognitive empathy now there's some instances where it's not possible or even appropriate to walk in someone else's shoes so this is empathetic concern this idea that involves a sh a showing appropriate compassion, which can lead to an action, and this is the key part, leaving an action, leading to some doing something to relieve someone else's suffering. And that's why I chose this work of art. This is by um, the artist um, Colwitz, and she lost her son during World War I, and so she did this print basically of like her and her husband. It was like kind of this very emotional thing for her. You know, like it's impossible, and like I said, inappropriate to try to think of somebody losing a child or a Holocaust survivor. We could never imagine the pain and suffering that they went through. So you could just, all you can do is show compassionate concern and take appropriate action, hopefully to educate yourself about the Holocaust and not deny it and things like that. So this part of it um, is empathetic concern. Again, just showing appropriate concern when, when it's impossible to walk in someone else's shoes or inappropriate. Historical empathy is the ability to understand and appreciate what was like from people for, who lived in the past. So this is um, based on, and this is why I use this photograph because this is kind of where my work came in. Um, Laura's here, Laura and I did, um, Laura's in charge of our evenings for educators and we did, and there's packets outside of the materials we developed and we decided to focus on historical empathy. We have a, um, a collection in the museum that shows people from the past, like this migrant mother. And this is based on the research that was done by Crystal Bridges. Have you guys heard of the Crystal Bridges report? Um, from, for those of you that haven't, Crystal Bridges is a museum. You know, like I think most museums um, want the luxury of being able to evaluate rigorously. Um, Crystal Bridges was founded by one of the Waltons, so they have the money to be able to do rigorous and big scale evaluations. It's a museum in rural Arkansas, and it was awesome in the sense that they had the perfect control group. None of the kids nearby had ever been to a museum, so they hired the University of Arkansas to come in and do a big evaluation of the kids that were able to come to the museum for the first year and those kids that weren't able to. And so it's a huge study, 10,000 students, 489 teachers, and over 100 schools. And what they discovered is that kids actually retain a lot of information based on what they'd learned, and a lot of it was this idea of historical empathy. For example, and that's why I have the percent, 88% of the students that went, and then they talked to them, I think either a week or two weeks, I'm sorry, um, after they visited the museum, and they were able to recall that these were abolitionists that were working industrially to, um, to, uh, to uh, get rid of the slave, um, the, um, sorry, that they were doing um, the sugar, they were doing sugar in order to, um, to get rid of the enslaved people, like in slavery in here in the US. So they were able to recall that these were abolitionists really protesting against the enslavement of people. They were, similarly, 82% of the students were able to recall that Rosie the Riveter dealt with women um, going into the workforce, and they were able to relate to that. 
So, and then this is the report that came out. So one of the things that they, or these are the several key things that happened with that report. They said that they were able to um, improve students' critical thinking, historical empathy, which is obviously the one we're focusing on, tolerance, and the interest in art museums. They expressed an interest that they wanted to come back to the museum to see these works of art and be able to um, talk about them with their families. So as you mentioned, like uh, this is all schools, rural schools is the one with the slashes, and then high poverty schools is a black area. And in all of those areas, those increased um, by more than point, like 0.15 standard deviation for um, historical empathy. So that's what we did in, um, in our program. So this lesson actually isn't in the program that we developed, but it's based on um, the, the research we were doing on the Crystal Bridges report that looking at photographs of people in the past increased students' um, historical empathy. So we looked at several photographs. We were able to pull some out from our collection. And so during our program, we talked about um, this migrant mother um, and the fact, so you know, just like I think what a lot of you guys did, we pull it out, we have a critical discussion about it, we give people an opportunity to look at the photograph, discuss what they're seeing, and have a dialogue and conversation of what they're seeing. And what this, um, we, so we talked about the fact that this is a pea picker, she would live during the Great Depression, a Dorothea Lange photograph that, um, caused um, the government actually to go and give food to these poor migrant people because once people learned of a story that her, her and her whole family of kids went to, to pe pe pick peas and the crop had failed. So they were, they were without money, without a lot of things. And um, unfortunately, by the time the government food went to the location where they were, they had already moved on because they were migrant family. So we talked about that with this photograph. We talked about this Cheyenne matron, um, this Curtis photograph of this woman. And then we also talked about these newsboys from 1909, and they're basically child laborers. And Lewis Hine was very much, he was a school teacher, and he was very much interested in eliminating child labor. Just kind of like those abolitionists were um, interested in eliminating enslaved labor, um, Lewis Hine was very interested, and because of him, child labor laws were changed because he was showing like all these kids, and we had amazing discussions of the kids. You know, the fact that if you see the little boy on the very right, his hand is like in his in his jacket because it's so cold, but he doesn't have gloves. So we talked about those things, and looking at all these photographs. And then what we had people do is write these I am poem, this idea of really looking closely, learning these people's stories or what we know of them, and kind of placing themselves this idea of perspective, taking perspective. So um, what I decided to do instead was just basically read some of the poems that were produced by looking at the photograph. So I'm gonna talk about the Cheyenne mother. This poem was written for, uh, about her after a, a lengthy discussion about this photograph. So this is somebody's poem. I am uncertain of the future. I see doors of opportunity closing. I hear the cries of my children, yet I feel alone. I pretend everything is going to be fine. I wonder inside if I can fool myself. I want to give them a better chance. I say this will pass. I hope they believe me. I dream of endless possibilities. So that was um, about the Cheyenne mother. Like every time I do this activity, like people's poems are so moving and touching and like I need to, bring Kleenex after everyone. Um, and then this is another poem that was written about the migrant mother, the pea picker, Florence Owens. I am not sure how long we can endure. I see a long road ahead of us. I hear the silence of my loud thoughts of despair. I feel the pain of my children's anguish. I pretend that my silence will give them strength. I wonder when there will be time for comfort. I want my children to have a better life and be happy. I say nothing 
just feeling the desperation. I hope things will change soon. I dream of a better life for all. Okay, so again, just like an example of an activity that we were doing that to really have people think critically of people in the past and have them um, think about the lives of these people that lived because um, they are like documentary photographs of actual people. Um, so with that, that's my example. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dan to provide um, examples of what he does here at the zoo. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, here at the zoo, our mission is sort of twofold. We, um, we enrich people's lives by connecting communities to nature, but we also enrich lives through our work saving animals from extinction. And so both of those aspects of our work play into how we go about engaging visitors here in the zoo. Um, and the, um, in education specifically, uh, we have a number of visitor outcomes that we are always trying to achieve um, based on what program we're doing. Uh, they include things like feeling welcome in nature and at the zoo, um, growing nature literacy, but then feeling empathy for animals and nature is one of our high level outcomes that a lot of our programs fit into. And um, I should say that a lot of the work and practices that we've developed have come from uh, consortium of zoos and aquariums in Seattle, the Seattle Aquarium, the Woodland Park Zoo, the Point Defiance Zoo, and Aquarium, um, who have been doing a lot of research into how to grow empathy for wildlife and what the implications are for that. And one of the things that research shows us is that people who feel empathy for animals are more likely to take conservation actions. And so um, that's an important part of that saving animals from extinction work that we want to be doing here. So that's background for why when we um, started a giraffe feeding program last year, we decided to make feeling empathy for giraffes the um, primary goal of that experience. And so um, we uh, gave some very specific um, we have some very specific ways that we interact with the public when they're doing giraffe feeding in order to help them develop that empathy. So there's some people feeding a giraffe. Um, you get to um, come in, um, pay your, like $5, you get three leaves, and you get to get really, really close to one of the giraffes who um, want to come in and um, eat as much of the leaves as possible. So when we think about best practices for developing empathy for wildlife, there are certain characteristics of the experience with animals that can help people to develop empathy. Um, so I wanted to talk about just a few of them that we try to employ when we're going through this giraffe feeding experience. Um, one is making sure that people are seeing the agency of the animal. So that means that the animal is um, making its own decisions. It's, um, we're presenting its uh, different behaviors of moving, of eating, of choosing to be there, of choosing not to be there. and so. We use very specific language when we are talking about the giraffes and what they're choosing to do and how we're helping people to see them um, during that experience. One of the things when we first started this was we weren't sure if the giraffes would actually even want to come over and feed um, with random visitors who were coming in. Giraffes can be really skittish. Um, luckily, giraffes also are um, like to eat a lot too, so that uh, was a bigger motivation for them. But we were very careful not to say we are training the giraffes to come and do this, um, but that we are giving them a choice and we're trying to make them feel comfortable, but they are making that choice about whether they're coming over or whether they're not coming over. Um, we also um, know that continuity is important. So just the more time you spend with an animal, uh, the more likely you are to develop empathy for it. Uh, it's a customer service thing, but it's an empathy thing too. And so um, we very specifically give instructions when we're doing this facilitation that you're not rushing people through the experience. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a busy day or not a busy day. Uh, we want people to have that time to get really close to the animals. 
Um, we know that an another factor is um, this idea of coherence. So seeing an animal as a whole, it's one of the reasons why it's a lot easier to feel empathy for an animal like a chimpanzee or a giraffe than say a barnacle, because you don't really understand what where a barnacle's face is or where its feet or legs are. Um, with the giraffe, you definitely can see that and you can see how close people are getting to the giraffe in order to really get a sense of the animal. Um, and then the other thing is how we frame it. And so we actually think pronouns are really important. We refer to the giraffes as he or she, not it. We talk about the giraffes' individual preferences and what they like and what they don't like because they are individuals, as opposed to referring to giraffes just like as a species, and this is something that all giraffes do, um, because having that individual connection with animals is something that uh, can help to engender empathy as well. So. Um, I think the thing I will close with, and this is very much a zoo concern and not um, other fields, although I think there might be some interesting connections, is there's always a concern in the zoo field about anthropomorphizing an animal. And so um, there is a difference between feeling empathy for an animal and anthropomorphizing it. And it speaks to those definitions that Veronica was talking about, where we want to understand what an animal's needs are, what an animal's uh, wants are, but it's from an animal's perspective. And when we anthropomorphize an animal, we are putting our human emotions on the animal. Um, and so that is um, not empathy, obviously, because you're not taking the other uh, entities perspective into account, uh, but it's been a really important distinction for us to make um, as we go through this process of figuring out how to help people feel empathy for animals. So that's our giraffe feeding experience, um, and then I will turn it over. Hi, thank you for having me today. Oh. Yes, nope, sorry. Got it. Um, so my name is Joanna Gessler, and I'm the director of education at Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, where our education philosophy is really engaging students and visitors through artifacts and personal narratives. So one of the things we really focus on is creating empathy through guiding students to understand personal experiences and really connect with those individuals. We try not to shock the students when they come to the museum. This can be an extremely heavy history and sometimes traumatic has some moments that could trigger people, can really traumatize actually people if it's not handled with care. So instead of having students, I think it was mentioned earlier, like imagine themselves in these extreme experiences, we bring the history to life through describing the individual people and making it about those people who experienced it. And um, one of the ways we, one of the best examples that I think, I think we should mention is that at the museum we have a replica of a cattle car. And cattle cars were used to deport people. They were packed into them. They were treated in really horrible, horrific, gruesome situations. And, you know, instead of closing the doors, forcing everybody to stand together in darkness, which uh, could be too heavy and really shock people into the wrong sort of empathy, we want to describe the experience that people went through. So we would share a story. And there's this one Holocaust survivor named Betty Cohen, who when she was being deported with her family, she was about 20 years old, she, they didn't know where they were going, and her father comes over to her and says, we don't know where we're going. We have an idea that it's somewhere not good, and I really think that you should go and speak with your mother and spend some time with her and, and say goodbye. And this was the last time she ever saw her parents. And so sharing the story and describing the feelings or emotions that Betty would have in that moment allows students the space to really form empathy and think about these individuals and what they experienced during the Holocaust. So more of a descriptive nation, uh, notion in education. And we really want to guide the students and guide the people. And we take a lot of breaks in time to speak about what are the students thinking, what are they feeling, what are they hoping. We want to stop and reflect with students so that they can develop an appropriate emotional response to what's happening. And also based on the age of students, we'll take them into specific galleries, not all the galleries, to really prepare them as they get older to come back again and build on that foundation of learning. And you can see in our gallery space, we have a lot of photographs and artifacts and not a lot of text. So we really want to bring the students into the gallery space and describe and discuss and analyze and look at. 
what we see. And we want the artifacts to represent individual people. So on the right hand of the screen, we have Joseph Alexander. He's a 96-year-old Auschwitz survivor from Poland. And he is standing next to his identity cards. And what does an identity card mean to a person? Why do they need it? Um, we speak with students, what do you think are in, is in this case? Oh, it's an identity card. And something interesting about Joe is after he survived the Holocaust and learned that his brother had perished, he actually adopted his brother's name. So his name, Joseph, was his brother's name. Um, and what does that mean? How does that change someone's identity? One of the documents in this case is also a driver's license, which Joe got at liberation. Um, he was liberated at Dachau, Germany, by American troops. And he decided to get a driver's license so that he could drive all over Germany and find any to see if any of his relatives had survived and collect information. What does it mean for a person to do something as normal as receive a driver's license after living through such abnormal experiences during the Holocaust and really stress to students and connect these stories and these ideas that are tangible to today. Today, we all know what a driver's license is. We can imagine what it feels like for people to have to get driver's licenses, to whom, which people are allowed to have driver's licenses, which people are not, and actually opens the conversation to forming empathy that is relative to what is going on in the world today. And we really want to create this space where people are associating this history with care um, and caring about other people to really bridge the history. Another um, thing I want to mention about artifacts is some of the artifacts we have in the museum, we don't know to whom they once belonged. So how do you, can, how do you have students bridge a gap and think about an artifact in our space and evoke certain emotions and <laughs> evoke an empathetic response to it? And we have a case of artifacts that are on loan to us from the Auschwitz-Birkenau Museum. And one of the artifacts that came to us is a little child's cup. So of course, we do not know to whom the cup belonged, but we ask students to really think about what that person, what that child was thinking when they entered Auschwitz. Why did they bring this cup? Was it their favorite cup? Was it their newest cup? Had it been given to them by somebody that they cared about? Um, where did they think that they were going with this cup? And really. To, having the artifacts speak to the history and help the history come to life a little bit. So of course another way that we um, speak to students about empathy is we connect them with Holocaust survivors. So this is actually Betty Cohen who I had mentioned earlier. She's 97 years old and she still speaks with students and at the end of all of her talks she goes and she hugs them and they hug her and everybody really, it's a, a beautiful thing because they connect. and. One of the things we discuss with students is that when you look at the Holocaust, it's really a form of dehumanization. Every single step of the Holocaust is a dehumanization process. So how do we maintain humanity? How do we main make sure that other people are accepting and respecting other people's humanity? How do we give back humanity to the victims? And I wanted to share um, this for one second because in Betty's hand here, so students had heard from Betty prior and then they wanted to make a gift for her. And so as Betty was in Auschwitz, she has a tattoo number on her arm. And so the students wrote adjectives about Betty that they connected with her about or that they thought of her. And they wrote these adjectives on their arms and took a photo of it and gave it to her. So one of them says, Betty, you are wise, powerful, caring, cool, lovely, proud, beautiful, brave, valuable, and not a number. And really having students think about these statistics or this history or this, these victims as individuals and as people in order to create a more empathetic response. And um, one of our outcomes that we really strive to reach is we want students to have a greater understanding of social justice and community responsibility. We want them to be more respectful and more accepting. And one of the ways that we try to capture this, this is always, I think, the biggest obstacle, um, or at least for us in the museum, is how do you, how do you see the long-term impact on that? So we send out a ton of surveys. We try to collect a lot of feedback from students. And actually, recently, I just checked that 89.5% of teachers said that they saw their they agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that they saw their students having a grading understanding of social responsibility. And that's really what we're striving for because, of course, as we all do here, we believe that uh, museums and history can really inspire a more dignified world, and we want to create a space where students can do that. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to our last presenter now. Thank you. 
thank you to MESC for inviting me to be part of this panel today. And um, thank you for everybody for being here. Uh, Manehu, my name is Diana Terrazas, and I am Community Outreach Manager at the Autry Museum of the American West, which is just right across the street from here with all the white tents. <laughs> We're setting up for an art market this weekend. Um, so I just wanted to, um, when I was invited to speak on this panel, it was a, it's about empathy. And so when I started to think about empathy in my work, I started to think about um, my role at the museum, but also more broadly in the context that um, I have a very unique position in that um, I oversee community partnerships and collaborations with Native and Indigenous um, organizations and community members, including tribal organizations as well. And so um, that constituency um, and how we connect with the constituency at the museum and how we connect outside the museum as well is um, under, my, under my role. And so when I started to think about empathy in this role, um, I started to think about really was this worldview of we are all related. And this is something that we talk about a lot in um, Native and Indigenous communities in that we are connected um, to um, the earth, we're connected to this place, we're connected to um, not also the objects, historical objects that are, we're stewards of as well. Um, connected to um, the ocean, connected to the animals, connected to stories. We're related to um, animals. We're, con we're related to a lot of um, kind of empathetic is natural to us in some way, um, deeply rooted um, in traditions. And so um, I started to think about that some more and how it's related to our work back at the museum. And one of the things is um, looking at the plants that we have growing outside of the museum in a new native um, plant garden she will call it new, it's been there two years. But how we speak about the plants as well as relatives. Um, I know a lot of the museum educators, they do a lot of work in that um, garden, and it's a teaching garden. And then we worked in um, consultation with um, tribal communities, ethnobotanists, cultural educators, and we brought them out to do co um, consultation, but we considered not the only consultants, but partners. And that was a real, real important um, in that, and also, challenge the way we thought about the plants, especially native plants to California, um, and our relationship as um, people to the plants, and how the people need plants, but also how the plants need the people as well. And so that really resonates with a lot of signage that we see at the museum, in the, especially in the gardens, and how we work with different um, community members, especially like the Gabrielino Tongfa community, who are very active with the museum. And so um, another thing is I was thinking about was um, some of the drop-in chats that we have at the museum and ways in which we're bringing community in to have a dialogue, first-person dialogue with the public to amplify those stories from, um, from peoples who may not necessarily feel like they have a voice or people that may feel like they're invisible. Um, so it's an opportunity for the people to come in, share their stories with the public as well. And that seems like a really, really powerful thing. It's been very positive for us. One of the things that I did um, for in September was for the closing of what we had was the life and work of Mabel McKay. And it was a wonderful exhibition. It was highlighting the first um, exib solo exhibition about a California Native woman in the museum, and she, uh, Mabel McKay was a well-known doctor. She was a basket weaver. She was actually the last doctor of her tribe. She was from um, Cache Creek Pomo, which is um, Northern California. And she was an um, activist. She was a, um, she had a multi, multi faceted life. You know, she lived the extraordinary life, a lot of people would say, and she did. And she was um, fluent in her language as well. So one of the things that we did was we brought her relatives, for the closing of the exhibition, we brought her relatives to come out. And three of her relatives, one of them was a master basket weaver who was mentored under her. The other one was a ethnobotanist, a, um, kind of like a medicine woman in some way, but I wanna say medicine woman. She was just like a um, really in tune with um, the plants, but she was mentored by Mabel. And the other one was her son, and so we had 
we had it set up so that each individual person can come in and, and really, really share what her story was about. And the public response to that was fantastic. I think we had a lot of interest, a lot of people who were nodding because it, it was a story about a woman, it was a story about a mother, and they could really relate with that. And so um, that was something that was really, really powerful that happened recently that I just wanted to share. But in addition to that, um, it's also amplifying perspectives of, um, amplifying perspectives that necessarily aren't being told in um, museums. And so human nature is another way that we did that. Um, in amplifying those stories from Native communities through traditional ecological knowledge, which is called tech. And so that was a great way of highlighting that story, that interconnectedness, that, um, that idea that um, it's community centered, it's not individually centered, um, that this impacts a broader um, community, not just individuals. And so it highlights the traditional knowledge coming from um, California um, tribal communities for the public. And so that was a really, really um, great exhibition. It's a permanent exhibition as well. So that was another um, thing of when I thought of we are all related and amplifying those stories. So it's connecting people with, um, with stories firsthand in different ways of doing that. But um, also I wanted to talk about, um, and I know Veronica had mentioned it, was the um, listening. And when I talk with different museum staff, I'm not necessarily on the ground floor, but I do talk with a number of museum staff regarding when you do bring in um, community members to share that it's a gift, that it's a gift that you are um, hearing. Some of the knowledge is communal knowledge. Some of it has been passed down from generation to generation, and they're sharing it with you, and that's a real, real gift. And so that's something um, that is really powerful. It's, it's listening. People may hear, but it's listening and really, really just, um, that's something that I do advocate for back at the museum. And also face-to-face -face conversations that just face-to-face -face conversations speak volumes. Also inviting, um, we have a lot of different people that come through. Um, we had a visit from the Maori. We have a number of different folks that do come in and visit. So we do arrange for different museum staff to come and meet and to um, greet some of their, our visitors. And so um, we make that happen, and it's a great way where we can bring staff as well as community members and have those dialogues and sharing what their work is about, but also what our work is, and kind of um, seeing if we can collaborate, but also, too, it's, it's humanizing the story in some way. It's bringing those stories to each other. And so that's something that um, we do. But also, um, a lot of the relationships and a lot of things are over time, and so we don't rush things. It's, it's things are always, um, I guess, building empathy takes time. Building those relationships takes time. It's not on a time schedule, and so patience, I always teach patience, <laughs> time will come. But um, I wanted to just to share those with you today. Um, going along, Diana, so now we're going to go to, I, I thought of a few questions. Um, kind of, I wanted to emphasize what are the best practices, essentially, of cultivating and building on empathy. And one is important about how we frame the conversation in order to better understand and empathize with others. And I think, um, Diana, you were talking about indigenous communities, and I think it's so important, because I was talking with Laura today about how history is represented of indigenous people, and how we museums are complicit in how we present the objects of indigenous people. I remember a talk at AAM where an indigenous person mentioned that it's, we always refer to them in the past, you know, these, but there's very much in the present um, and that it's cultural annihilation when we present indigenous people that they just lived in the past or they're the objects or just from the past. So could you talk, I, th I think you, you mentioned um, amazing examples, but could you talk a little bit more about how you work to increase people's knowledge of how you frame the conversation differently about indigenous peoples, both their past and their present? 
Right, and so I think one of them is um, not to speak of us in the past, that our cultures are thriving and living today. Um, I just was in a webinar last week and there was some alarming statistics that were shared that I think was 60 or 70 percent of um, people in the United States don't, or maybe it was students, let me reframe, but um, they're not aware that Native Americans are living today. And that is really alarming. And so I do want to stress that it is very important that um, people put us in a contemporary context, but also to um, it's, it's something that um, I think visibility is also another thing as well, as visible as we can be through sharing our narratives, sharing our stories, integrating our stories into a larger context of American history is always a good thing. Um, but also to, um, I'm always like, don't impose your, your preconceived notions about us on us. Um, let us share what we wanna share with you listen, learn, but also too, there's um, 573 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and they're all tribes, pueblos, villages, and so it's hard to know, um, and we're all individualistic. Everybody speaks their own language, everybody has their own different views, and their own traditions, and so don't clump us all together. <laughs> we're not all the same. I think that's the a main takeaway um, I see a lot. Um, also, too, like when you're in a museum and you see our cultural items, especially the historical items on display, they take a certain significance, and that's where the, all the related came into. Those are our relatives. Those are made by our ancestors. And so for us, it's like I'm a, I'm a basket weaver. So when we go into museums and we see our baskets, for example, on display, they carry the spirit of our ancestors in there because they're from the very land that we come from. They they're contain the spirit of the weavers. Um, they are not only history, but it's a living history. It's a living culture. And so we do practice a lot of the things that we did before, but we honor our past, but we were contemporary people. And so I think um, amplifying that a lot, you know, I know everybody's in museums, so please do your due diligence. <laughs> but um, I think that's, those are some of the things that I do. You know, I help um, put people in touch in my museum with um, cultural educators, cultural practitioners, you know, tribal delegates, you know, different um, people who can help um, teach and um, share that narrative with us. And what do they want to share? Yeah, and really amplifying that. Thank you. Thank you. Like amplifying that and us taking the time to listen, as you mentioned. Um, another best practice of de developing empathy um, is, um, I think one of you mentioned it, or actually Diana, you talked about, like it takes time. And one is take time to develop relationships. And Dan, you talked about this a little bit, that um, having role models that are very invested in conservation or taking care of animals, that kids tend to do that if they have a role model. However, we're in informal <laughs> institutions for the most part, and we often don't have the luxury of developing those relationships um, that take all that time. Um, can you tell us about how you approach this idea of using role models to develop empathy? Yeah, um, so one of the things that we have done in our educational programming is we've shifted away from the traditional mommy and me style classes and moved to family classes. And so the things that we offer are um, for families to come together and um, learn together and um, that way kids can see their parents um, and the parents can be role models in that case. Um, so engaging entire groups, um, whether we're doing it in a program or we're just interacting with visitors out in the zoo is an important part of our practice. Um, the other is really that Instead of, um, we, we are transitioning a lot of our sort of talks and information presentation to skill building. And so when we are engaging with these families, we want to give them things that they can do after we stop engaging with them, because we know it is only going to be a few minutes. And so we have done things like um, create stations out in the zoo that are timed, like our talks used to you know, continue to be. Um, but it's a place where 
families can come and um, learn how to look at an animal and practice doing it with that particular animal, but then take those skills and be able to go to other parts in the zoo and continue doing that work. So, so giving them the ability to practice and continue practicing even when we're not engaging them is another important part of the way that we're doing that. Um, Jordana, this one is for you. Um, going along with what Dan just said about direct contact and direct experience is another very important and critical and basically the starting point of developing care and empathy for others. And um, as you guys can imagine, spending time with people that are different or people that have different experiences is critically important. Um, you obviously showed very important um, and powerful examples, but why is it so important to you to provide experiences with Holocaust survivors? Because um, they're having to share such devastating stories and kind of putting themselves out there. So why do you think it is so important? I think, I mean, this was said before about the idea of active listening and face-to-face -face storytelling, and it really is, I think, a privilege. And we, or not like a, a gift, um, to hear another person's experience. And I think the best way, and we talk about this at the museum, the best way to kind of combat hate is to understand and to learn. And so when we have, because of the, the context of the museum, there's a lot of conversation about hate speech and what does that mean and what are the implications of that? What does it lead to? What is the ripple effect? And to bring together groups of people who are of different ages, of different backgrounds, to hear from somebody who is north of 83 years old and speaks with an accent from Eastern Europe or Western Europe, I, it really, I think, breaks down those barriers and those stereotypes and those ideas. And for many survivors, it is difficult, uncomfortable for them to share. And we don't ever ask or push people to do more than they're comfortable doing. But I do think actually at the end of it, some of them leave saying that they got more out of it, they feel, than even the students did. Because to see students of all ages reflect what the survivors went through and learn from it and see it as an opportunity of growth for our community, I think ultimately is the most positive impact of that. Thank you. Um, now this question could be for anybody, because um, empathy you could do empathy wrong, um, and some of you addressed that. Um, Jordana, you talked about triggering. Some things are so devastating that it triggers somebody and they just shut down and are not willing to listen anymore and are incapable of understanding. Um, and Dan, you talked about this, about anthropomorphizing, when we put our human feelings onto animals. And the example that I remember reading about is octopus. Like, oh, that octopus is so alone. He looks lonely. Well, octopus live alone. That's what they want to do. And so <laughs> there's um, problems when we try to do that. So how do you or what do you think our role as educators is in addressing these barriers, obstacles, misunderstandings when it comes with dealing with empathy? Um, well, I think, I think that it just speaks to the importance of intentionality. Um, that, um, so as an example, we do a number of talks out on grounds um, where we are working with our animal care staff and they are doing husbandry behaviors with an animal. So elephants, uh, seals and sea lions. And so an audience can come and see them doing these things that could really easily be perceived as tricks. Um, and if we're perceiving them as tricks, we're taking away agency from the animal and we're losing empathy in that case. And so we have had to very intentionally use language that um, speaks to animals making choices um, when they're doing these things, um, doesn't use the language of tricks and um, uh, coercion, um, but it's about um, being really purposeful in how we describe the, the various aspects that are out in the zoo that you might not think are um, uh, negative, but um, if you're not kind of being thoughtful about it, can actually turn into a counterproductive experience for the visitors, even though it's something interesting and exciting that they're getting to see. I guess I would just add, um, always humanizing the history. So on the other side of it, the 
when we talk in the museum about um, Nazis and their collaborators, kind of identifying that these people were human beings and that really when you're looking at the Holocaust, it's creating um, or understanding that everything is the capacity of people, right? And really having students think about that and not moving into the space where we act as if the Holocaust happened in a bubble or that it happened only in one compartment of history or aliens came to this country or this world and did this. Like really having them understand that these are human to human interactions, I would say. I think right now, obviously, with what happened last night, um, what happened in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, like it's just so devastating to think about what other human beings are capable of but then why these stories of Holocaust survivors are so much more important to talk about and humanize. And, um, and Diana, you talk so much about like making things visible, making people visible, their stories heard. Do you wanna address um, about when empathy could go wrong or what you think or how we potentially could make things worse than better? I kind of agree what Dan said. Okay. I mean, there's just, um, I haven't experienced anything, like it's gone completely opposite than what my intention was, but it is kind of similar to what had Dan had said, yeah. Thank you. I think we're um, wrapping up time, unless they, <laughs> see, I don't, see, wrap it up, and then I did. Um, <laughs> Um, are there like very, very pressing question, one question or anything for any other panelists or anything? Yes, Marie. Well, first off, it's consultation. So it's um, discussion with the, um, what people call source community, but it's uh, really the community who is, this particular piece is from their culture. So first making contact, um, opening the discussion with that particular community, um, and we don't put them on display. Um, so that's part of it. That's part of the dialogue. Um, but there's also that conversation with the community as well. That's very, very important to get their viewpoint on what is the responsible thing to do um, and what our obligation is. And so, um, yeah, we just had a discussion, I think two weeks ago about this very thing, but we invited um, tribal delegation um, to come out and the appropriate people to come out and to talk about this. It was just with museum staff, it wasn't to the public, but those are discussions that we take inside the museum that don't necessarily, um, that guides what is on display and what's not, and a lot of those things get vetted before. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, yes. Okay, um, so I, I think you could see from the examples we presented about how some museums and zoos are really trying to address this very critical um, human aspect and animal of, um, of trying to cultivate empathy for other human beings and beings in general. So thank you for this part. <laughs> thank you.